But the thing about risk management is that all too often we forget that risk management is just that. It is management. It is not firefighting. It is not panicking. It is actually having a plan, actually having a game plan. And, and, and it falls in line with those of us who actually fall into these categories. Some of us are this anal retentive. We are those folks who have a just a passion for process and documents and, and sharing and making sure that other people are aware of the bad things that may happen to us and the impacts they may cause. The true risk management plan, and let me rephrase that, the true risk management plan, and notice where I put the emphasis on that, risk management plan is rooted in these three elements. It's rooted in our, our basic desire to ensure that Everybody has a common understanding of what it is we're paranoid about and what processes we follow to ensure that we deal effectively with that paranoia. So if we just follow the process, is that enough? Well, yes and no. The problem is there are different processes. The PMBOK process, for example, is we plan for risk management, we identify, qualify, quantify, develop responses, implement and control those responses. Welcome to the PMBOK. That's where it takes us in terms of risk management plans. But the sad thing is, is that it doesn't recognize the dichotomy that exists across our various projects. Now, most of you fall into that kind of category or at least similar projects too, the one on the right here, the software type. And it gets down to, well, how big is big? Some of you are working on initial development, ground-up kind of efforts, and if you're doing that, it may be a very big effort. It may be multi-year. It could be something that's expected to involve a large volume of resources across a span of time. By contrast, some of you are simply doing the upgrade to something that already exists. And if that's the case, you're talking about a much smaller window. Thus, you have different interpretations of what a risk is. What is it that, you know, really matters to you? What is it you're paranoid about? And look at the last bullet here on both of these columns. What happens if we fail? That's always the question. Now, risk always ends with the really ugly question of, and then you die. Um, the question with what happens if we fail, we, we would hope that that never ends with, and then you die. But the reality is, we have to ask ourselves, are there lives at stake here? Some of you are like, uh, Carl, I'm doing an upgrade to a documentation program. I do not think there are lives at stake here. Well, fine. How nice to be you. But there are also people out there who are doing projects for medical equipment and so forth. Those people who are doing those same kinds of integration efforts or programming efforts, those people have basically that what happens if we fail question answered with, and then you die. And we need to make sure that we understand the parameters and just how big our risk management plan is, how important it is when it comes to developing this information. This all kind of works together. What has to be in a good risk management plan, and again, I'm going to be hammering that throughout our time together, it's a risk management plan. And the first thing is the process. And we're going to talk about each one of these elements, but we're going to talk about all of these, and all of these components need to be in there so that we have some good sense of what goes in the various and sundry tools, including things like the risk register. Uh, the, the building blocks over here, by the way, are here for a reason. They're, they're over here because um, when it comes to what we're doing, it is a stage of building blocks. And any of you who have ever played with your own kids' building blocks, you know that you've tried doing some really fancy stuff by putting the caps and the, and the long tubular-like things, putting those down on the bottom to make long columnar structures, and the thing collapses inevitably. The foundation pieces need to be there first. You need the big flat bricks. And the big flat bricks that exist in risk management are not the high-end tools like Monte Carlo and so forth. The big flat bricks are the things that are identified here and that we're going to walk through when it comes to what exactly belongs in a risk management plan. That's what we're going to be talking about today, and it starts with process. Process and language. You need at some point to have not just a kickoff meeting, but a risk kickoff meeting. 
And actually, it's kind of compelling. Uh, the risk kickoff doesn't happen at the kickoff meeting. The reason being is the original kickoff meeting for any project was designed to get people enthused and energized. Risk generally does not get people enthused and energized. In fact, the risk kickoff is to let people know, here's what I'm afraid of, and I want to know what you're afraid of. And, and the third bullet there, permission to speak freely. People have to know they can talk openly about risk. Now, I'm about to head out on travel this afternoon, and, well, I'm, I'm going by train. Now, I want you all to think for a second, what's the bad thing that could happen to me on that train? Now, at least one person out of the 250-plus in attendance here had it in their head, your train could crash and you could die. We're real reluctant to say that out loud. We are. We're reluctant to say that out loud because, oh, Carl, don't say that. It might come true. Well, it's, for one, it's not coming true. Trains are one of the safest forms of transportation. But for two, we're afraid of creating self-fulfilling prophecy. So we need to have a risk kickoff meeting. We need to have a structure to let people talk about risk. That means we have a structure. We tell people, look, right up front, the reason we're doing this is so that we can preclude this stuff from happening, not so that we can point fingers and say, who would allow this to happen? What evil could befall us? We're not going down those roads. This is a positive event. This is upbeat. This is something generally good, good, good. And, and it's very hard to get people on board with the notion that you're actually working toward an, an, a universe of planned clairvoyance, where you actually have a structure to be the smartest person in the room, to be the person who is able to predict, well, this stuff might happen to us. The amazing thing is most of the stuff that falls under that planned clairvoyance is there because you've encountered it before. You've run into those problems. There are certain intersections. I live in the Washington, D.C. area, and there are certain areas within Washington, D.C., where, frankly, you know there are going to be officers of the law sitting. I grew up in small-town Ohio. In my small town, there were certain spots where you knew officers of the law would be sitting in their cruisers just waiting for the opportunity to bring in a little more revenue for the local community. Well, now, you know that. I know that. But the first time I got a ticket in D.C., I can tell you, I didn't know that. And I went into work the following day, and I said, oh, jeez, I was driving down Glebe Road, and I got a ticket. And they said, where? I said, down by military. And one of the folks at work said, oh, the cops always sit there. And I was like, oh, well, thanks for sharing. Nobody had warned me. Nobody had let me know. It would have been awfully nice if I had had the heads up that that was one of their favorite speed traps. But nobody let me know. And now you know. Glebe Road down by military. There's always a cop sitting there. But just so you know, it's, it's planned clairvoyance because somebody somewhere has experienced it in the past. So the first thing we have to do is give people license to speak freely and the environment to speak freely. Now, you can do this with brainstorms, but let me suggest to you that brainstorms are often counterproductive when it comes to risk. The reason being is because it forces people to say their negative fantasies out loud. Instead, let me suggest to you that the best risk kickoffs, the best opportunities are written rather than verbal. And the reason being is because there's a little more anonymity to it and that makes people a little more comfortable with having the risk conversation. The risk conversation goes to the, uh, the second half of this, and that's language. Language is everything when it comes to risk, and it's important to make sure that you get people to speak risk well. If you can't get them to say risk statements well, you're toast. And the reason you're in trouble is because, frankly, you won't know what the risks are. I live in, as I said earlier, in the Northeast, and, and one of the things that was interesting, just last night, we had some major, serious uh, thunderstorms plow through here. 